Thanks for thanks for inviting me. Thanks everybody for coming out at this hour and this weather. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know if I can tell you much about creating democracy. First of all, and the the title of the slide and even the pictures may be a bit misleading because instead of looking at whether democracy does or does not exist in the Soviet space, instead of looking at what varieties it takes, I want to take a step back and ask an even more fundamental question. But what do we mean by democracy when we look at the former Soviet space? And how do we measure democracy in that region? Uh, now, measuring democracy may seem like an abstract academic pursuit, uh, often obscure and filled with different methodological uh, details, but I'd like to make the argument in the next 20 minutes, and I, I really don't think I should take more than 20 minutes because I know it's late. Uh, I'd like to make the argument that defining and measuring democracy when we look at a region like a former Soviet space is absolutely crucial. And not just for academic uh, scholars who are writing papers about democracy that have statistics in them. It's also important for shaping how policymakers think about what creates democracy and shaping their decisions when it comes to democracy promotion or aid allocation. And uh, on a more general level, it's, it's crucial for just all of our understanding of what creates and sustains democratic governance. So I want to give an example of what I mean. I'm sure a lot of you, or at least some of you, know that uh, the paths that countries have taken in the former Soviet space have been very different. In other words, some, some have done uh, better than others. Uh, so here are two countries. Uh, quality of democracy is measured on the y-axis here. Uh, higher is better. And we see a clear divergence. In other words, they start in 1990 at about the same level of democracy, and then they diverge. One country experiences increased uh, increased centralization uh, from the, by the president. The other experiences a uh, 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 crackdown on corruption, more ties with the West. Uh, parliament that stands up to the president when it comes to the, his choice of prime minister, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I'm curious if anybody would like to offer some perspective uh, candidates for uh, for the dotted line, the dashed line. Anyone that come to mind? Mind among the Belarus. 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 So Belarus certainly <laughs> not a good place to be for Democrats. The last uh, autocratic state in Europe. That that could be a possibility. Any others? Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan, what was that one? Moldova. What, whatever? Mon Moldova. Oh, Moldova, yes. Moldova, uh, okay. Potentially Moldova, also not a bastion of economic freedom. Okay, so we have a few candidates here. What about the solid line? Estonia. Estonia, definitely sort of, uh, when it comes to democratic development, it's considered among the best in the former Soviet space, absolutely. Any others? What about Ukraine? Ukraine, okay, so we see uh, maybe since Absolutely the Orange sure Revolution, no. maybe, okay, what you, what, you guys are from Ukraine, no. you agree? No, <laughs> you disagree. <laughs> okay, any others? Lithuania. Lithuania, any of the Baltic states, really, yeah. uh, potentially. Okay, well, I'll save you the suspense. I, I hate to tell you, this is a trick question. This is the same country. Oh. <laughs> this is the same country. Oh. This is a measure of the quality of democracy in Russia as measured by two different indices. The dashed line shows you the quality of democracy in Russia over the past 20 years as measured by Freedom House. How many people have, are familiar with Freedom House or have heard of it? It's a well-known sort of organization that ranks countries according to how democratic they are. Fairly influential. <laughs> Top one is an index called the Polity 4 Index, which is uh, very commonly used both in social science and in policy to measure countries on a scale from negative 10 to 10 in terms of how democratic they are. This is not good. This is a very bad picture. If we really think that measures of democracy can tell us something about what's happening inside the country, this should give us pause. Yeah, that was consistent. How do we explain this? This is a huge problem. This, this basically, if you knew nothing else about democracy indices and you saw this, you'd say, these indices are totally useless. Yet they're used all the time, not just by academics, not just by policymakers, but by a lot of people who are trying to figure out what's going on, whether inside countries, other regions as a whole. This must, is a must have measured different, different. That's that's absolutely true. The, the measures are very different. And uh, what I want to talk about is why. How do we explain this? And the key to understanding this, I think, is that it's not just the democracy measures are bad. Yes, that's part of the problem. How do we measure something as abstract as democracy? There are many different ways of looking at it. The problem is even more fundamental than that. Um, these problems stem from the way the creators of the measures 
conceptualize and define democracy. This is a problem of definition, not a problem of measurement. And different definitions stress different elements of democracy. Uh, so we can talk about the specific details, maybe we'll come back to this, of why these stories are so different. But they stem from the way these indices focus on different elements. And what's worse is you can make plausible stories to fit the graphs, as I did before I showed, I showed them to you. All the, all the things that I said that could account for either rises or declines were true. In 1999, uh, Duma stands up to Yeltsin's choice of prime minister. Their, their polity score shoots up because polity score looks at how elites contest policies. Freedom House is much more focused on participation at the grassroots level, individual level. Uh, uh, a very different vision of what democracy ought to be. This is a philosophical disagreement. So, why should we care? Well, I think, hopefully I've made the case that we should care. This is not just about measures. It, this affects how we conceptualize where democracy comes from. And not to mention important things like who gets the aid. This is particularly important because we want to know whether countries are democratic when they're right on the border, whether they're leaning more towards democracy or more towards autocracy. So it's those regimes that are in the middle, uh, those are the regimes where we need the best measurements. Unfortunately, it turns out those are the regimes for which we have the worst measurements. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So, as I said, uh, I want to focus on the problems of definition as the root source of divergence in these measures. Uh, disagreements like the one I just showed you uh, reflect inherent trade-offs in conceptualizing democratic governance. Uh, so at least, so here's a few of these measures. Uh, two of them I already mentioned. Uh, Jaworski et al. is a popular measure that is on a, it's either a zero or a one. So it's a, unlike polity, which is a continuous, continuum um, of democracy, Jaworski says either democratic or not, either free or not. Right? So that's already a very different way of conceptualizing what we think is, is democracy. Uh, then the, the Von Hanna measure, which looks at uh, voter turnout and fragmentation of parties. So these are very different visions of a, of a, of a single concept. <coughs> and though at least some of them aspire to be objective, all of them ultimately represent rival notions uh, of, a, of a very complex concept. So partly to say that one measure is more accurate than the other kind of misses the point in some ways because they represent an overlapping but non-identical conception of a complex phenomenon. Um, so some of these trade-offs are obvious when it comes to what we think of as a democratic regime. Uh, so some approaches adopt, some approaches to defining democracy adopt a minimalist definition, uh, while others bring in a whole wide variety of attributes that you must fulfill in order to be considered a democracy. So Freedom House, the Freedom House Civil Liberty Scores, for example, includes dozens of subscores, measures of media self-censorship, uh, industrial production quotas, government control over sermons, uh, nepotism and university admissions, a whole number of factors, uh, socioeconomic inequality, uh, so, you could make the charge, you could critique it from the perspective of saying that uh, it conflates the process with the outcome. In other words, if you have so many different things going into what you define as democracy, if democracy is measured by positive outcomes like lack of corruption, like economic equality, then it becomes impossible to measure democracy's causal impact on those things. Because countries that promote economic equality become democratic by fiat, by definition. And the impact of regime type on economic equality becomes not something you can study, but a tautology. This is bad if you, if you want to be a tautologist. Now, a minimalist conception, uh, something like polity, has a whole other set of problems. So uh, polity looks at basically how much elite contestation is there at the top level. What? Elite contestation. Executive restraint. How much leeway does the president have versus the government? Uh, so it focuses on those procedural aspects of democracy at the elite level, but it ignores mass participation. Does anybody want to guess when the United States becomes a perfect democracy according to polity? So there's an increase, and then at a certain point, according to polity, democracy, it's a 10 out of 10 democracy. It's a perfect democracy. The majority uh, in Congress different from the uh, party of majority different from party of majority. Uh, contestation, you would think so. Uh, that's, that's one way. So then we'd have to go somewhere in the early 19th century. Right? That's, that's not the year they, they point to. And it's not all too, if they were really consistent, they should start with 
Anybody want to guess the year when America becomes a perfect democracy? It's 1871. Why is it 1871? I'm not sure. Probably something to do with the, uh, the expansion of voting rights after Civil War. But if you rate the United States as a perfect democracy from 1871 to present day, you completely ignore the expansion of suffrage to women, to African Americans, basically until the 1960s, to citizens over 18 years of age. All of that just flies out the window if you define democracy the way the polity does. And if you think that mass participation is a key component of democracy, then polity for is a terrible measure. Uh, moreover, if you look at point two, there's not all aspects of democracy go together. So majority rule often comes in conflict with individual liberties. Uh, if democracy is defined as the will of the people, which is one way of looking at it, then the Bill of Rights is an undemocratic institution. The Supreme Court is an undemocratic institution. It's a liberal institution, but it's not a democratic one. It does not reflect the majority of the opinion of the people. In fact, it exists especially to protect the minority opinion. Okay? So there's a tension between mass participation and individual liberty that carries through to the modern measures of democracy. Uh, so if you, uh, the Economist Index, the, the, the Economist Journal produces an index of democracy, or has for the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, and it counts mandatory voting as a bad thing, because mandatory voting uh, infringes on your individual liberties. You have to get out of the house and go vote. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, mandatory voting improves the quality of mass participation. In fact, especially among people who don't generally vote, like the disenfranchised, like the poorer people. So Van Hanen, the other index I showed you earlier, uh, counts, uh, counts turnout in elections as, a, as an indication of democracy. And turnout in elections is directly influenced by mandatory voting. Therefore, it actually says that mandatory voting is a good thing. Countries with mandatory voting receive a higher score on one index and a lower score on another index. This is all, this is, these are all huge problems. Okay. Uh, and, and the divergence between these two measures reflects a fundamental disagreement about the essential nature of democracy, about the majoritarian, majoritarian vision of democracy and the libertarian vision of democracy. There's also things like historical context. Uh, what was con what were considered democracies in, in the 19th century would not be considered democracies today. Uh, and we don't even have to go back that far. During the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and the United States uh, proclaimed them themselves to be democratic societies, but emphasized different elements of democracy. Individual liberty in the case of the United States, and social justice in the case of the Soviet Union. Um, so of course these conceptions were partly self-serving and partly hypocritical, but they also had a profound effect on Cold War politics. Uh, the protection of human rights as it's enshrined in a number of international treaties was impossible during the Cold War precisely because the two superpowers could not agree on the common definition of democracy. Uh, again, if our definition is so highly contextual, that creates a lot of problems. Uh, if you look at the history of political science, which is maybe more esoteric pursuit, uh, conflict with other major powers has caused political scientists to view them as less democratic. So, before 1914, the, the only political scientist who became a president, by the way, anybody know who that was? The only political scientist who became a president was Woodrow Wilson, which just goes to show you sometimes having a background in theory does not mean you could produce actual results when it comes to getting a Senate to sign on to the League of Nations. Uh, before 1914, Woodrow Wilson was a scholar of Germany and German bureaucracy, and, and other prominent political scientists like John Burgess and others portrayed Germany. Germany as a progressive state with a liberal constitution and a meritocratic bureaucracy. It was one of the forerunners of the welfare state in 1878, setting the precedent for things like unemployment insurance. Uh, but very quickly after 1914, the country is relabeled as a militaristic semi-feudal monarchy, the barbaric Huns. Now, that is not to say that Germany was a democracy before 1914, but the shift in how people perceived it was huge. Uh, this suggests that there is both context at work and ideology. Freedom House that I mentioned before, which is an influential organization, well, the majority of its funding comes from the U.S. government, between 16 and 80 percent. Um, so, and it has formally stated that it's, it, it views the promotion of democracy through American leadership as essential to human freedom. And this is not just this is not just an organization that measures demar measures democracy. It is an advocate for a particular kind of democracy. Um, 
So the choice of definition is shaped by all these things. And the choice of definition affects measurement. And the choice of measurement affects these things like policy outcomes. So I want to very quickly, and in the time I've left, which 10, 15 minutes? Talk, all the time you want. OK. Uh, talk about some of the particular, some of these problems that appear in the former Soviet region in particular. And we see a lot of things like redundancy in subscores. So often indices are created by taking different attributes, sort of blending them together in an index, and then coming up with a single score. The economist index does that. Uh, that creates problems if some of your subscores are redundant, if they capture the same thing. And I'll talk about that more specifically. Uh, moreover, there seems to be a disconnect between looking at whether an election happened and how good of an election it was. Having an election doesn't really tell us much about the quality of democracy. Stalinist Russia held elections. Uh, Everybody, I think pretty much everybody today holds elections. I don't know if North Korea holds elections. But there are, any number of, there, are, there are a number of Central Asian countries where that hold elections and where the leader gets 99% of the vote, miraculously. Belarus could work. Belarus said, yeah. So this is, uh, elections don't necessarily tell us anything about the nature of democracy, especially today. And there are problems with when we compare regions as a whole. So don't be frightened by this uh, next chart. Uh, I'll explain what it is in a moment. Okay, so subscore down. Let me down. Let's see. So the index takes different measures: rule of law, extent of civil liberties, uh, free elections, public participation. Aggregates them all together into a single number between zero and ten. But you could make the argument, I think, a fairly plausible argument, that free and fair elections and high levels of participation require and, in fact, imply rule of law and imply civil liberties, so that the latter two measure, measures are redundant. And in fact, government functioning is very highly correlated with free elections and participation. There are scores that are highly correlated with each other. Now, why is this a problem? Uh, well, when you have a bunch of subscores that are highly correlated with each other, the statistical effect is uh, to increase the variance of, of scores of democracies in different countries by pulling the distribution of scores towards the tails. That is, the level of democracy in democratic countries will be exaggerated the level of autocracy in autocratic states will also be exaggerated. Okay? Now this gives us a testable hypothesis. What if we take out what I think are redundant measures in the EU score? What happens to the score then? Well, look at what happens. What are these countries on the left? Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. How would you characterize those? Democratic or not? Not democratic. Now let's look at something like here. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. These are democracies. So what does that mean? It means that the difference between the original score and the modified score is negatively related to the level of democracy. That is, countries that are autocratic improve their score once we take out redundant measures. Countries that are considered democratic, their score decreases. Their, their score becomes less good. Countries in the middle, the effect is about zero. It's hard to say. There's no way. Okay? <coughs> Um, so this is a problem for several reasons. It exaggerates the range of regime types, and uh, it makes bad states appear even worse than they are. It makes good states appear even better than they are. Uh, the overall effect is to underestimate the regional level of democracy. And in fact, if you adjust for redundant subscores across the former Soviet republics, the average democratic score goes up. So can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Um, are you just arbitrarily taking out certain things that seem um, even intuitively um, redundant, or are you doing part, like statistical parsimonious analysis to, to weed those out? Well, I don't know if there's a, you mean, do I use matching to take to choose which subscores to take out? So this, the, well, I mean, for example, the, the example that you gave, like certain things are pretty obvious that they're highly correlated, so do you just kind of, okay, well, what if we take this out, and um, what result do we have, like, or do you, are you actually using parsimonious analysis, like nonlinear, Regression to kind of weed, right. have the, the statistics weed out some of the things that. Yes, yeah, so this is, you don't need fancy techniques here, right? This oh, is no, a, no, 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 but this is a theoretical argument. That is, let's start with how we theorize about what democracy is, right? right? So, if we think that in order to have free elections, you must have rule of law and civil liberties. If you think that in order to have high levels of participation in politics, you need rule of law, you need civil liberties, then we have some redundant scores. So then the measures of rule of law and measures of civil liberties are redundant because there are already, already variables in there that reflect the effect of these variables. Right, I see what you're saying. So 
you just want to see what the effects would be if you do remove some of those redundant things and which what those things are it's almost immaterial given it's know, not like, a material it's there has to be a reason for it oh no i understand right. what you're right. saying the material what i mean is like if, as you say it's a theoretical argument <coughs> so yeah I see overlapping right. yeah overlap overlapping and sort of um confounding they they, they yeah. feed on each other to exaggerate the score <coughs> But your this is not the, this does not represent their real what you think of as the real democracy score. This represents how much change there is from their previous score. Right. Well, right? First of all, one thing I if, if you take home one point, it's there is no real democracy score. All these measures are arbitrary to some extent. What this represents is what the new score is like compared to the old score. So if you look at Uzbekistan, <coughs> there it represents change effective adjustment. So Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan score goes up by, by about 0.75 if you, if you take out the redundant variables. It goes from whatever it is, 2 or something low to, to 2.75, which is not a trivial change, right? If you look at Estonia, their score goes down by a bit, by 0.25 or so. Yeah, but you already asked us what we thought are these democratic states, and, and obviously they're not, and these are, relatively. So it isn't that, that I mean, we, we need some way of gauging what we're going to think these really are, right? And, and you're not saying that this represents how democratic the country is, but just how much the score I'm saying has, in, has changed as a result of taking things out. I'm saying the way these things are measured by the economist exaggerates how democratic the countries are that are democratic. I'm not saying Estonia is less democratic than Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it exaggerates just how democratic Estonia is compared to these other states. Mm -hmm. And it exaggerates just how autocratic Turkmenistan is compared to these other right. states. Um, yeah, so I already talked about this. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned was election outcomes versus election quality. So traditional measures of electoral participation, voter turnout, not very reliable indicators of democratic quality because they ignore differences in, in how these elections are carried out. There's a line by uh, Tom Stoppard in one of those plays, it's, it's not the voting that's democracy, it's the counting. Uh, it's not whether you vote, it's who's counting the votes. Uh, is it? Well, I, that'd be the first time that Tom Stoppard and Stalin were in the same sentence. Here. Maybe not. Stalin is a source of all sorts of uh, these are the great quotations, yes. Yes, yes. Well, it's true, I've heard this. Um, so this, this problem is especially acute in countries that are in the middle, the competitive autocracies, where there are elections, but those elections are often flawed. Um, elections where the incumbents abuse state resources, deny the opposition media coverage, harass opposition candidates. We can think of any number of cases where that takes place. Uh, manipulate electoral results. You don't have to look very far in, in the post-Soviet space to see evidence of that. So if that's the case, can we try to figure out if, that's, if this disconnect is happening in our statistics? So I took two measures. One is a measure of democratic quality, as measured by uh, one of the indices. Another is a measure of election quality, which measures once an election takes place, how good of an election is it on a scale of zero to one. And uh, if we thought that having elections meant you had a democracy, we would expect to see a positive linear relationship like in the line. Instead, we see that it's kind of all over the place. We have countries where, uh, where uh, democratic election quality is fairly high, like in Uzbekistan, but democratic quality is very low. We have other cases like Armenia, fairly high in democratic quality, but fairly low in election quality. So there's not a good correspondence between, between there's not, we can't get at good measure of electoral quality through the, a lot of these indices. This is a different measure of democracy. This is the Van Hanen measure. This is even worse than the last one. There's absolutely no correlation between voter turnout and election quality. Voter turnout can tell us nothing about election quality. And if, therefore, if we think that voter turnout is a good indicator of democracy, we should seriously reconsider this after looking at this graph. Van Hanen, who uses voter turnout, might not be able to tell us much about the quality of elections that take place. And of course, turnout was always high in the communist states. Uh, may not be that relevant. And research or policy that focuses on the quality of elections, I think should definitely keep this limitation in mind. Uh, measures of democratic participation are not sufficiently sensitive to election quality. So how do these different measures 
evaluate particular countries. Well, here's all 15. I don't know, can you see in the back? Um, two different measures, 15 post-Soviet states. Um, and there are a number of countries where the measures are basically in agreement. Can anybody uh, see a pattern? Where, which are the cases where there's the most agreement? Belarus or Azerbaijan. So we have Belarus to some extent, right? Not in the beginning. Azerbaijan, we have Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Latvia, Lithuania. Okay, so the cases where measures agree are the cases where everybody knows what the country is. We know that Estonia is, is pretty much a democracy. No country is a perfect democracy, of course, but when it comes to comparing in a former Soviet space, we can agree on what Uzbekistan is or what it's not, right? So these tend to be clear-cut cases, even though even in some of these cases there is some variation in trends. Uh, in, in other countries, there's noticeable differences. Take a look at Tajikistan, for example. There's a, in, a decrease in democratic quality in the early 2000s for quality, while the Freedom House reports an increase during the same time. Well, how could that be? Azerbaijan is quoted by quality as becoming less democratic in its early history. Freedom House reports an increase during the exact same time. And for a few of these, the, the two indices are completely different. Uh, possibly the most dramatic one being Russia that I showed you earlier. But uh, take a look at Armenia, where there's a huge temporary dip in the polity score in the mid-90s. But the, the corresponding decrease in Freedom House is much less noticeable. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, this is Kazakhstan. Uh, now, now, in the previous slide, there were only two, two measures. This is uh, how many? Seven measures? So this is seven different measures of democracy in Kazakhstan. Depending on who you ask, this is seven different countries. Okay. Uh, well, some are in agreement. Polity and Freedom House, this is POL and FH, are uh, basically in agreement uh, that there's been a decline, although the decline in polity is much more gradual. Uh, for Van Hanen, VAN, uh, there's a gradual improvement during the late 1990s. Uh, so depending on which measure you use, Kazakhstan could be judged as becoming less democratic remaining a stable autocracy, as in the case of the Zhivorsky, which is a zero the whole time, or undergoing partial democratization, as in the case of Van Hanen. Uh, at the same time, the measures do converge a bit over time, but I would be suspicious of that, because it could be that there's uh, better measurements. It could be that there's a rise of conventional wisdom among, among all the people who are doing the, the coding about what we think of uh, Kazakhstan. Um, so this is uh, looking at uh, how much disagreement between scores there are, essentially, based on your average democracy score. And if you notice, the, the most disagreement is about those countries that are in the middle. This is where there is the most variance among measures. Um, if you look at, if you break it down by country, you see there's very little disagreement, uh, both, both uh, on this end and on this end. It increases right in the middle for these countries, like Russia the hybrid regimes, the competitive autocracies that are not clear cut autocracies or democracies, and precisely those states where we need the best measures of democracy. Those are the ones where we have the worst measures. So measures of democracy for these countries are particularly unreliable. And drawing any conclusions about the causes or effects of democratic development in these countries is, is very sensitive to the ch uh, choice of measure. This is bad if you're a policymaker trying to figure out if, if your policies in, say, Georgia are working or not. Um, and looking at it as a region, how do the indices agree with each other in terms of capturing overall regional trends? Um, so here's a regional average according to five different indices, and once again, there's very significant variation. Polity generally ranks the region as more democratic than other measures. That's the one on top. Van Hanen ranks it as much less democratic. Uh, what, what conclusions can we draw? It's hard to say, depending on what measure you use. Uh, here it is where we compare average level of democracy in the former Soviet republics as a proportion of the average level of democracy in Eastern Europe. In other words, who is doing better democratically, former Soviet republics or Eastern Europe? Well, uh, there is some agreement that former Soviet republics are on average less democratic than countries in Eastern Europe. They're all below one and they're all, a lot of them are declining. According to Polity, again if you look at uh, this line, uh, the region has become steadily less, steadily less democratic compared to Eastern Europe, but leveled off in the 2000s. Freedom House records a sharp relative decline, you see in the, in the beginning there, uh, and no sign of leveling off. Uh, in Manhattan, there's no such trend. 
Eastern Europe is more democratic, but this relationship is stable over time. Uh, Jaworski, this is the bottom line right here, dash line, rates the former Soviet republics as much less democratic, but records an improvement after 2004. And why? Because two of the countries switched from being zeros to being ones. Georgia and Kyrgyzstan. That's a questionable choice of measure. Uh, so a scholar who's comparing democratic development in former Soviet republics and Eastern Europe uh, would, would come away from totally, with totally different conclusions based on the choice of measure. If, if you're using polity or freedom house, you would say there's been steady deterioration of democracy in, Eastern, uh, in the former Soviet republics compared to Eastern Europe. Um, a scholar that look, looks looking at von Hahnen would say that yes, the former Soviet republics are less democratic, but they've been stably less democratic. And if you're looking at Jaworski, you'd say, you know what, former Soviet republics are actually doing a lot better uh, relative to Eastern Europe over the past ten years. And avoiding these spurious conclusions means you have to, you need some knowledge of the region as well as noting the coding particularities of these different indices. So given this all this confusion, it's not surprising that area specialists, people who actually study the countries are often very skeptical about these large N indices. And for a good reason. Uh, regional comparisons that use these large N statistical indices have to pay very careful attention to both the choice of measure and the state effects on the ground. Uh, so, so I don't think I need to restate this, but uh, measure of democracy in the former Soviet republics are fraught with potential problems. Uh, I think that's a diplomatic way of saying it. They disagree about particular countries. They disagree about mixed regimes in particular. Uh, and because their definitions focus on different elements of democracy, they look at the same outcome and draw very different conclusions. And these definitions, uh, sorry, these differences stem from uh, divergent normative considerations about various aspects of, of democratic governance. Uh, and what can we say? Is, is polity that focuses on executive restraint more correct and Freedom House that focus on individual liberties, or is the focus on electoral turnout more important and the focus on legislative fragmentation? Uh, are we right to penalize countries with mandatory <coughs> voting because they force you to leave the House and go vote? Or should we reward them for increasing participation, especially by people who are otherwise disenfranchised? Uh, the answer really depends on the specifics of your research puzzle, both as, a, as, a, as an observer of democracy and a scholar and a policymaker. Each measure has its own strengths and weaknesses. And the nature of what you're looking at should, I would say, shape which measure you choose, uh, which strengths are the most suitable for the issue being examined, which weaknesses can be most plausibly overlooked. So, for example, if you're looking at if you're looking at the democracy's relationship with corruption, you should not use Freedom House because they define democracy by not having corruption. Uh, the substantive elements are already built into the measure itself. It will get you nowhere if you try to figure out what's doing. If you're looking at the expansion of suffrage over the 19th century, polity is a terrible measure to use because it does not care about mass political participation. But if you're interested in uh, constraints on governing elites, maybe polity for is a, is a decent measure. Um, so the various problems is not to say that statistical measures ought to be thrown out completely. I think that would be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, or it doesn't even mean that the applications of these measures are inevitably flawed. But it does mean that you have to have two crucial caveats anytime these indices are used. First, you have to justify the choice of measure in relation to what you're actually examining, like the examples I just gave. Um, second, once the choice of measure is made, conceptual emphasis on inherent limitations should be made clear when evaluating both the causes and consequences of democratic development. Next time you see a report by Freedom House, keep that in mind, because it makes claims about what's happening in the world of democracy as a whole. So I'd say highlighting the limitations of a measure uh, can also highlight its strengths um, by capturing the particular element of democracy that's most salient uh, to the research puzzle and or to the policymaker, uh, policymaker's interest. Uh, measures of democracy should be treated with great caution. And for some countries, they may be completely unified. Um, so the careful use of measures is not a panacea by any means, but being self-conscious about these potential drawbacks and uh, being aware of the theoretical and definitional implications of large N indices, I think can, in the end, ultimately improve the analysis, if not by any means perfected. Thank you. Wow.